Hey there, IndyCar fans. This is Nathan Brown, your motorsports insider with the Indianapolis Star. I'm actually sitting here at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the Media Center in one of these little handy podcast taping booths that IMS added a couple years ago. Really nice touch and really handy for a day like this, especially when there is a lot of downtime. This is, we're taping on Tuesday afternoon. This episode of IndyCar Weekly here with my co host, Stefan. Wilson, um, been a lot of downtime today, at least in terms of uh, on-track activity. As you very well may know, by the time you were listening to this, cars were on track for uh, just under 24 minutes this morning as part of their initial two-hour session that was supposed to break and then come back for an additional five later this afternoon. Uh, It is still raining outside Uh, It was raining before I stepped in here. I imagine when I step out, it's still going to be raining. So not a whole lot of confidence that we're going to get a whole lot of running in today. We will see how that all plays out. Um, But Stefan, maybe just to kick it off to you first. I I was looking this over last night as I was getting ready for opening day of Indy 500 practice and had actually forgotten that last year we had a rain out on day one of practice on that Tuesday. And I believe we'd actually had a rain out uh, the year before, maybe on Wednesday or Thursday of 2022. And those have been the only full rainout days that we had had for uh, 500 practice weeks since 2016. Now, today isn't technically a full rainout, um, but a guy like Kyle Larson, for example, who is chomping at the bit, uh, needing to get up to speed to get used to this IndyCar, even though he's been in it a, a couple times already. I think he only got in two laps this morning. Um, and that fastest lap went at about 147 miles an hour. Um, so a little short of where you would want to be when you're getting comfortable for the car. So Stefan is, um, as a, a one-off driver these last couple of years here, what are some of these guys, especially um, those guys who aren't full-time in the sport, what are those guys going through and those teams going through if they haven't been on track either with this driver or this car or this crew been together? Um, as you can, I would imagine, hope that you're getting a bunch of hours into bank as you're getting ready for qualifying weekend, knowing that there's going to be bumping on the line once we get to Sunday. Yeah, no, it's uh, mentally it's tough because you just have all this energy built up in preparation for the start of uh, a, a practice, you know, the first first day on practice, there's just, there's just so much energy being built up. Um, and then you get there and you, uh, in last year, in my case, yeah, we, the whole day was rained out. We didn't even get to start. So we're there and it's just hurry up and wait. You know, you're just chomping at the bit to get in the car and go. Um, but, uh, you know, fortunately last year, we, we got a full day in the open test. Uh, which was a good prep and a good way to, you know, get uh, get you know get up to speed. But this year, they even missed a lot of that first uh, that only day that they they got in the open test. Uh, they missed most of that as well because of the rain. So it's uh, it condenses everything. You have this game plan, a run plan with your engineer. Okay, we want to test this, this, and this on the item list. These <clears> are the <throat> important um, important parts that we want to test um, and. You know, if we get through those, then we can get on to these uh, secondary items that we want to test. And every time that weather impacts uh, track time, that uh, run plan, that test plan just gets more and more condensed and you get less and less time to get through it. So, um, you know, especially now with the way that the month is is set up, oh, I should say the two weeks, um, you know, miss, you know, we don't have the Monday. So we get four days of practice. Um, and that's my dog in the background. So <laughs> apologies for that. Um, but, uh, then we have fast Friday, which is a completely different boost level, uh, mm-hmm. and suddenly going 10 miles an hour faster. So you usually focus on just on qualifying on those, uh, on that, on that Friday. So uh, all of a sudden, uh, you look at it and go, oh, we have four days of practice. One of them's, uh, dedicated just to qualifying. And then one of them's rained out you've really only got two days of, on track. So it's not about so much the drivers getting up to speed. They're all professionals, you know, so it's only going to take them uh, a more, you know, a, a morning or half a day just to get familiar, get get, get the feel. Obviously for Kyle, uh, his situation, he's just going to be mostly 
I would expect him to be getting stuck into heavy traffic running. What he needs to learn is getting familiar with how that dirty air impacts uh, the handling of his race car and and knowing how to time that that run, getting the runs out of turn one, out of turn two, and you know, and, and vice versa on the back on the other side to come back and, and make passes at the end of the straight. So, you know, that's um, I assume is going to be a big uh, element on on uh, on his uh, testing agenda. Yeah. Um, we'll touch more on uh, the lead up to Indianapolis 500 qualifying that we have on Saturday and Sunday, along with uh, practice the rest of the week. But let's touch uh, back on this weekend's on track action at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the road course, the San Sio Grand Prix. That was the, uh, what, the fourth points paying race for this 2024 IndyCar season. And uh, if you were watching, on saturday and and felt like it was a little bit of a flashback to last year's race you're you're definitely not alone alex polo um last year started third and wins by 16.8 seconds this year he starts on pole and wins by more than six seconds and frankly it probably would have been even more than that had they not had a restart with about 20 laps or so to go um never even, even in the moments when he lost the lead, and he lost the lead on lap one to Christian Lungard, and Christian held on to it for, oh, I would say maybe a little bit more than a third, close to half of the race. About 30 before, laps, I think, yeah. Yeah, 30 laps or so of that 85-lap race before he eventually gave it back up. And if memory serves me right, it was in a, a pit sequence where they um, shuffled. Um, I think Alex went maybe one lap longer and just was able to shuffle out ahead with the blend and and things went from there um so a, an impressive race from alex we saw another pretty dominant weekend for him at the thermal club uh as he has gotten this season going so far a lot of the same that we saw from him a year ago he's now got one victory in the first four championship races he hasn't really had a bad race yet i think his worst finish is um, what maybe sixth or so his worst finish last year was eighth. Um, so very similar in that way. And we'll have to see once we, especially once we get into this uh, post 500 time, really, if this is the same Alex Polo type season that we'd seen in recent years, last year, he, he goes and t- wins the 500 pole after winning the San Sio Grand Prix and then goes and wins the next three races after that at Detroit, yes. at Road America, and at Mid Ohio, um, that felt like that was kind of the championship turning point. He went to the 500, um, a strong, dominant team and driver, and a month after it, the championship was kind of his. So I think it's still too early to say that he's, you know, uh, um, certainly doesn't have this wrapped up, but. Um, emerging as one of the maybe two, three or four guys that we really need to keep an eye on as we maybe start kind of trimming that group of contenders down from what typically starts the year as, you know, anyone from a group of 10, that's a couple of McLaren drivers, uh, a couple of Andretti drivers, the three drivers from Penske and probably the two from Ganassi, you probably get to eight or nine really quickly there. And I'd say it's maybe cut in half, just kind of how things have gone so far, unless someone has a really big turnaround. Um, anything that stuck out to you, Stefan, from Alex's performance and just kind of how he and this number 10 Chip Ganassi Racing Honda team have looked so far this year compared to their dominant championship run of a year ago? Yeah, no, I mean, the Indy GP just looked like a carbon copy of what he did last year. You know, he kind of uh, held with those guys when he was on the the uh, primary tire or when he was on the scr- uh, scrubbed uh, alternate tire. And then when it came down to when he had the, the tire advantage going on to the, the brand new uh, prim- uh, alternate tire, you know, that's when he could show the, the advantage that he, a pace advantage that he truly had. And he just sprinted off into the distance. So, you know, it, it, I remember him doing the similar strategy last year and it just felt like like a, re- a repeat, honestly. Um, so yeah, I mean, it kind of has that feeling last year. He arguably was, I felt like on track every day, seeing him and what he could do, where he could place his car. I was like, that's the car that we need to be like that. Everyone needs to be, he looked 
like he had so much confidence in what was underneath him, the package that he, that he had, uh, that the team had brought to Indy. He just looked uh, really, really strong and uh, knew that he was going to feature pretty heavily in the race. And I think he would have been the, poss- you know, who knows how it would have played out, right? But he was definitely going to be in contention. And if he'd won that, then he would have well, had five wins in a row uh, last year. So it's definitely is setting himself up uh, to to right last year's wrong um, at it, at the five hundred. Uh, after after Indy, uh, it's going to be interesting to see if he can keep up that form that he had last year uh, post Indy. Although it kind of has, I kind of have this sense that Scott Dixon, you know, he has had uh, he's been able to chip into that um advantage that Alex has seemed to have you know he's he's found a way to to close that gap and um you know he, he's still uh show that he's still got it <laughs> even uh at his age you know so you know I think uh by winning uh you know winning a race already this this season um and you know just the fact that um you know he he did, uh, at the end of the last season, uh, start to get a couple of wins in, in, under his belt. So I, I feel like there's going to be uh, some competition there between just his teammate. And then, like you said, there's going to be the handful of other drivers that we uh, we always see rise to the top as well. So I think he might have a little bit more of a challenge uh, going forward to to kind of keep up that same form that he had post Indy last year. Yeah, I don't know that this is a season, at least just kind of looking at where the, the points are right now. And, and certainly depends on, you know, I mean, anyone, Alex, I mean, the, the guys that are up here toward the top, any of these handful of guys could go on that type of a streak. They're capable of it. You just have to have the yeah. car. You have to have the luck and also have to have a flawless string of races, race weekends as a, a driver. Um, just kind of looking at the points as they stand right now alex uh i i pulled it up now his his worst finish this so far this year is fifth uh that came at barber wow. and that was at a race where um i think they essentially just kind of went with the wrong strategy as far as things played out but i think also had a really good car and had um the yellows falling a little bit differently that that could have been a, a different race for him and who knows maybe we could be looking at two wins in a row for alex uh but he's he's not created a massive gap yet so far willpower just uh 12 points back even with his loss of 10 points that he um got at St. Pete for the Penske or for the penalties that team Penske went through. Of course, he also did um, gain what he gained eight points um, from jumping up two spots. So really only lost two there, but the fact that he's got uh, three runner up finishes already this year and four points paying races is pretty wild. This does feel like, you know, maybe potentially like that year that, that will had a couple years ago in 2022 when he had his championship. But I feel like this is also one where Will's probably going to need to win more than a single race. And that's all he won that year. That year, Alex Polo, we all know was going through all of his off track dramas. um, Didn't win a race until the season finale. Um, We obviously have already seen that Alex is in prime Alex Polo form seemingly. So Will is going to have to, I think, find one of those three or four win seasons that we just, I don't think frankly have seen from him in a little while is mm-hmm. as great as he looked at in his championship season two ago. Um, but he's still certainly one of those guys that you would consider at this point is in that championship hunt. Scott Dixon in third um, tied with Colton Herta at 127 points. So that makes um, 25 points back of Polo. Felix Rosenquist as great of a year as I've seen as much speed as they've shown. I still, I don't know that I can include Felix as a true title contender in that top group yet. Um, Yeah, he needs to show the same pace on Sunday and the same dominance that he shows on Saturday. You know, like if he could do that uh, a couple of races, then I think you could really see them being uh, a, a contender. But, you know, right now they've got to fix that. And the pace is clearly there, the one lap pace qualifying. So, Once they figure out that and unlock that same performance for Sunday, I think that's when you can really count them as a, as a front. And you go, I mean, you go down this list. uh, I mean, like Scott McLaughlin has already had, and I mean, he he hasn't had 
two terrible weekends on track, but you now have to look at his St. Pete weekend yeah. um, finishing 27th instead of finishing third as he did. So you now have two finishes outside the top 25. If you're McLaughlin, virtually no points. Um, you've got to be pretty much perfect the rest of the way. Same thing with Pato Ward, who now we consider the winner of St. Pete. He's had three consecutive finishes of uh, outside the top 12. Um, mm -hmm. Even someone like Kyle Kirkwood, who's, had four finishes inside the top 11 through four races this year. But like, unless you really turn things around quickly, um, yeah, it's... I wouldn't, I wouldn't count out Scott McLaughlin yet. I mean, he Maybe. seems like he's really bounced back, uh, since the St. Pete drama, you know, yeah. and you consider, you know, winning Barber and then it was a nice recovery drive by him at Indy GP. Um, I, did he finish fourth or fifth? Was it? Scott, Scott yeah. finished sixth. He, he sixth. finished sixth. Yeah. yeah. So, he, you know, like that was a good recovery drive um, on a on a weekend. I think he had bad qualifying. Uh, so, you know, managed to still get some good points. Mm -hmm. And he just seems like mentally he's he's bounced back and, and he's in a good frame of mind. So I think as long as he's consistent, can, can limit those, uh, you know, uh, bad weekends that, and you know, like you said, make your your worst finish, uh, you know, higher than six, uh, and and make that Indy GP result his worst finish of the year. Then you know he can he can still feature. I think he's got the consistency there around him. Uh, good pit stops, obviously at Team Penske. Whereas I just don't, yeah, you, know, you said it with with Kirkwood. Although he's shown pace, I don't know if he's shown the consistency yet to to really make up the ground. That he's yeah. already lost uh, to Palu. Yeah, um, I would tend. To, yeah, I, I think my point with Scott is that like he can't have any more bad yeah. weekends. Basically, he's so he's at he's sixth in points. He's um, nearly seventy points back right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's we've got thirteen points paying races left. So still a lot of time to go. But we have to see that Scott McLaughlin that we saw um, at Barber. Or, yeah. or like like a, a weekend like the GP kind of has to be his bad weekend the rest of the way. I think if he's going to claw back in here and obviously going to have a have to have a heck of a lot more great weekends than so so weekend if he's going to it, get it. His, his performance at Barber just kind of in my mind cements him as being a threat the rest of the way. Every time we get to a road course like that, say Mid Ohio, mm -hmm. Road America, you know, places where Palou dominated last year. I see him hopefully um, being able to contend and, and actually, you know, come out on top. And then maybe that's makes, makes things interesting. Not only does that help his case, you know, taking 10 points off of Palou, but it also prevents uh, Palou taking out 10 points uh, advantage over, you know, someone like Scott Dixon or Will Power, you know? So I'm mm -hmm. hoping, you know, from a neutral standpoint, I'm hoping for it to stay close and stay exciting the rest of the way. I don't want to see Alex run away with it too, too easily. So um, yeah, I, 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 I'm hopeful that, um, yeah, I'd like to see Scott, you know, get a couple of road course wins. And he, I think he's, I really, you know, I'll say it. I think it comes down to his performance in the 500. Just the last couple of years has been not ideal uh, results for him. You know, he's a DNF in 2022 and 2021, I believe. Mm -hmm. And last year, I did he DNF last year as well. I think he might have. Yeah. So he's got to have a good result in Indy. And, yeah. you know, that's going to set him up for the rest of the way. Like you said, that could make or break the year for him. Yeah. All right. Let's go. Um, I'll, I'll rattle off the the top 10 that we had at the San Sio Grand Prix. We've already spoken on a handful of them. Alex Plo, um, again, dominant day, finishes first. Will Power, um, 6.6 seconds back in second. Christian Lungard is first really solid. Um, weekend of the year and yet still i think one that they still felt like um was a little bit short of their hopes still still looking for a win on this track for this team it's been so dominant every single time we visit here um they finished third to um finish up the podium scott dixon uh fourth another chip ganassi racing driver marcus armstrong it's three ganassi cars in the top five and fifth scott mclaughlin sixth colton herda seventh alexander rossi eighth graham rahal ninth and felix rosenquist in 10th place i know we have a couple of these performances that really stood out to me i i, I would say 
outside Alex, the the drive of the day was probably um, Colton Herta, who had, if you were watching qualifying on on Friday evening, just a gut punch of a session in qualifying. His team short fills him. Um, they are planning on running two full lap, two full flying laps at pace on the sticker red tires in round one. They had put enough fuel in there to get him through about a lap and a quarter, a lap and a half. And he has to pull off course into a runoff because they quite literally ran him out of fuel. Um, He was, I think, tracking at that point. The checkered flag maybe had flown or was close to and um, have to think he would have moved on to at minimum the fast 12, maybe even the fast six. He starts the race 24th with some great strategy calls, clean stops in the pits, and just an overall really strong um, day on his part. He climbs all the way up to seventh, and I know um, he gave a pretty terse interview after the race, uh, was really frustrated with some contact that he felt like his teammate Marcus Erickson caused on lap one that forced her to, to go off track into the runoff, lose any ground that he had built in a handful of cars getting bunched up and squirrely going off track uh, in the run into turn one on lap one. Um, and yet he still finds a way to get to seventh having started 24th what was what did you see both maybe in that incident with Marcus when you were watching it live um as as well as what you made of that performance for Colton which on my perspective something different that I feel like we haven't always seen the fact that they were able to turn a bad day into seventh something that I feel like has been missing in these hopeful title pursuits that we've been waiting to see from Colton for a couple of years now. We know we've got, we know he's got the speed. We know he's got the talent. He's got the racecraft. He just kind of has to piece all of it together. And I feel like this was a very Alex Pillow like weekend um, for him to be able to recover that way. I mean, it was a really impressive drive, you know, a lot of maturity, like you said, to come back from the adversity um, of not only starting 24th, but you know, uh, having the incident and pretty much going back all the way to 28th. So when you consider how many cars he probably passed uh, all day, he probably passed 28 cars, you know. (laughs) So um, a lot of clean passes, some brave moves. um, And most most of the positions were gained on track through passing, Mm -hmm. uh, passing the car, which we didn't see a whole lot of passing like all day. So he was the only, like one of the only guys that were really making a lot of, uh, a lot of moves. So, um, you know, I think the, the situation with Marcus, um, it was, it all happened very quickly. So it's really hard to say, uh, see what happened. And then we never really got Marcus's version of events. Um, mm-hmm. you know, it kind of looked like Marcus, may have not been i don't really see marcus intentionally driving his teammate off the track you know that doesn't seem like marcus at all um and especially not with his teammate uh so it kind of looked like there was a bit of movement from marcus that got took him into colton and then kind of a funky thing happened where the two cars looked like they kind of grabbed you know the the tires rubbed and they kind of grabbed and that inertia of going wide there to set up for turn uh turn four um, just kind of carried, you know, accentuated the situation more than uh, more than it looked like, uh, more than it uh, would have if it was, say, it happening into turn one or something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. So it kind of just, it looked worse than maybe it, it was. Um, but it, the consequences for Colton were still pretty severe, you know? Uh, it took him, I, I'm just amazed that he, uh, you know, quickly was able to recover from that and, and not lose uh, ground to the whole pack. You know, he could have easily end, ended his day right there if it had happened um, just a fraction earlier and he'd gone into the tire barrier. So, yeah, uh, lucky to, to survive that and recover from that and just an amazing drive, definitely drive of the day to, to take it all the way from 28 back to 7th. I know we have some drivers that we want to touch on toward the bottom that had some much more frustrating days. I I want to highlight um, a driver real quick that 
hasn't made a whole lot of noise for better and for worse, quite frankly. Um, Kiffin Simpson, rookie driver for Chip Ganassi Racing. Um, I know there are a lot of folks coming into this year with a lot of questions as to whether Kiffin was ready for this level of driving. And I think there was some thought from his camp and from Ganassi folks as well, just thinking, you know, I think he's going to learn as much, if not more, and be prepared for running IndyCar full-time in 2025 as much, if not better, by running IndyCar full-time in 2024 compared to running another year of Indy next. And he's not he's not someone that you're hearing a lot about on the broadcasts. He's not starring in qualifying per se. He's got four finishes out of five races in the top 15. And this is a really deep series right now. If, if you now, I know he's in a Ganassi car, like he's, he's got one of the best cars on the grid, but if you just go and add up the cars um, at Andretti Ganassi, you're at eight, Penske, you're at 11, McLaren, you're at 14. Um, and we know that um, Felix, super strong, Graham and Lungard, super strong. Um, there you're already at 17 of 27 cars on the grid. And he is presently, he's 18th in points, um, but he's had, he's had, yeah, three top 15 finishes. I he's He's not crashed once in a race. I don't even really remember him having any, big shunts or accidents in practice or qualifying he's been really measured with um you know in a way in which i feel like we often see rookies who feel like they need to maybe prove themselves yeah. or trying really hard they can get over their skis they can get past that 100 percent mark really easily and i've just been really impressed with with kiff and I, another quiet solid day he goes and finishes 15th um he's still a, a little ways back of his teammate linus lundquist in that rookie of the year um, race. But at the same time, Linus, as great as he was at Barber finishing third, he's also had a finish of 21st and a finish of 24th, which are both worse than Kiffin's worst finishes this year. So I think there could be a secretly really interesting rookie of the year. Yeah, no, I, I 100% um, agree with you. He's done a really solid job. You know, you can't really ask for much more. Coming into the year, I think there was a you know just a lot of question marks. I think everyone was kind of like, maybe this is too soon. Uh, maybe he should have done a year of another year of Indy Next and just really proved himself in that series. Um, I mean, you know, but like you said, what he's done really well is coming into a team that there's a lot of expectations. He's not let that affect him and and made made him overdrive and make mistakes. You see that a lot of times when guys, you know, come in first year with a team uh, and it's it's a top top team like Andretti or Ganassi. There's just, it feels like there's just weight of expectations on your shoulders um, to deliver and prove that you deserve to be there. And he hasn't let that affect him. He said, just keeping it clean, running every lap uh, and learning as much as possible. And I, I agree. I think he's probably going to be set up really well for 2025 if he keeps this up and just keeps learning. Yeah, you mentioned the the phrase there that you mentioned, I think is really important, running every lap. I know I can think of a couple of rookies over the last couple of years where you crash like 25 laps in in St. Pete or even I can't remember exactly who all was involved in the crash on lap one a year ago at St. Pete. But like you think about that, I, I know ben, Benjamin Peterson was one of them. Yeah, that was the one I was thinking of like. You just lost, and again, that crash wasn't Peterson's fault. But when you look at that moving forward, Benjamin just lost a hundred laps that year to just yeah. get better and get comfortable. We know how little testing, time, goes, yeah. how, how little off-season, preseason testing goes on in IndyCar, uh, and you're getting it on an actual race track. Such a um, a tough thing and and he's uh again uh, i don't we don't need to spend too much time on them but just been a really solid thing um to see from him not necessarily been noteworthy but been been good we'll we'll go further down the list um i know a driver that maybe similarly we were kind of expecting a little bit more from having seen how well he debuted at long beach um compared to what we've seen at him at Barber and now on the IMS road course, Teo Porcher, who we now know is going to be running the rest of the non 500 Indy car races this season in the number six Chevy of Eric McLaren, as we touched on, uh, as I touched on, um, 
in last week's episode, we know the story behind David Malukas, Malukas and his exit there now. Um, but I think there was a lot of promise. And again, I don't want to make any too, uh, too many maybe snap judgments on Teo. But when you see someone like him go and finish in the top 12 at Long Beach, we think back to Christian Lungard, who shined so brightly in his debut um, on the IMS road course a couple years back. I think it was maybe in 2021. And he qualifies fourth. I still think he finishes in the top 10 or top 12, showed a bunch of speed. And I think we saw some of that from Teo at Long Beach, a track that you don't necessarily expect to see it. And so I think there were some of us, uh, I would say me included, um, that were really excited to see what he could yeah. do at tracks that are maybe a little bit more similar to what he's used to on the junior formula ladder system in Europe. And Granted, this Aaron McLaren team he's with has not had an easy couple of weeks at large, let's say. Um, there have been so much going on in the background. I don't know how much that necessarily affects someone like Teo, but let's just say it's been a chaotic month or so from that team. And so even if there's a tiny thing missing on speed or you have, you know, the team has to go and, and replace two engines between warm up and the race on Saturday for Pato and Rossi. Now, again, those were their first engine changes of the year. So not a super big deal. Maybe you question why they were pushing those quite that far when, um, when some other teams had already made their engine changes either at Barber or before the GP. Um, anyways, I think there was maybe just hope that we might have had one of these two races go a little bit better for Teo. And obviously he's not in the car now for the 500. We'll see him again at, at Detroit. But what what have, as you have watched him develop over these three race weekends, again, his first three race weekends in an Indy car has had virtually no um, testing of yeah. any kind at all. He's still getting up to speed, getting used to this car, getting used to this team. What have you noticed as you've been watching him ramp up in this um, indie car shot that he'll get the rest of the year? Yeah, no, I mean, last time we spoke was before Barber. So it was before the David and Malukas uh, news broke. Um, and yeah, I was really bullish after Long Beach. I thought that going to Barber, Indy GP, we're going to be tracks that really suited Teo and we'd see him really shine. Uh, you know, we, we know his pedigree. We know what he's done in super formula, what he's done in, in formula two. So really expecting him to shine. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've kind of just been really disappointed really, you know, just not seeing, uh, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of David Malukas. Um, you know, I feel like watching him come up through the ladder seeing what he did the two years with Dale Coyne Racing, I am shocked, disappointed that Aaron McLaren have done what they did. And, you know, yeah, he broke his wrist doing some of mountain biking, miss, miss races, but I feel like he would be doing a very, very good job for Aaron McLaren in that six uh, right now uh, or, you know, when he gets back healthy. So I'm just, when I compare what Teo's done to what I think David would have done in that car, um, it makes me just really question uh, what they what their uh, decision-making process was there. Like, I just don't think it, it's been a, 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 a solid move. I think it, um, they might be questioning the move themselves right now, but I'm fully ready to eat humble pie because, you know, I'm sure, um, Teo is maybe also disappointed with the results and he's going to come and prove us wrong maybe, but I'm just, you know, I, I feel like they, if they were really trying to get the best results for the six, uh, the best results possible, the best finishing position in the championship, just stay the course, you know, uh, David has proven himself in Dale Corn racing camp for two years, had some really good races is familiar with the ovals. You don't have to switch guys in and out for the Indy 500 or, you know, for ovals coming up. You don't have to get someone that's never done an oval before and get them up to speed on an oval. I, I just don't understand the decision-making process to, you know, to, to uh, let him go and, and replace him. So that's just my opinion. I, um, the, the couple of things I'll add there, I, I don't know if this has been something that maybe has just been either getting worse or not getting better for David, or if things were maybe a little bit worse than what we were led to believe back when this injury took place in February. Um, 
but I will say, I think after after this news broke um, the day after Barber on April 29th, um, you started to hear more solidly that David was definitely not going to be ready for 500. And I think even now, from from what I've heard about kind of his timeline to come back, if he were to have an opportunity to get in the car, I don't think he's going to be ready before mid-June. Mm. So if if that was now now maybe that's a more relaxed timeline where he's not under you know pressure he's not you know spending every moment that he's awake during the day doing things for the sole purpose of trying to get better maybe he's taking things a little at a little bit more relaxed less stressed pace i don't know i haven't spoken to david about it but um if he truly wouldn't have been able say to be back in the car until laguna and you're at so that would make it seven races in a year. And even if if that point it's 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 still kind of an uncertain fluid window. Yeah. I guess one of the things I, I I do feel, and this is not something that anyone has told me, I think Aaron McLaren would have and I, I'm not necessarily saying that they should have or shouldn't have done this, but my view on it is I think they already saw David having a bit of a short leash, um, rightly so or not, because he was not their first choice for the seat. I don't even think he was his, the second choice for the seat. I think they would have hired Callum Eilat if he had not had a team option that JHR was holding over him. And so I think McLaren saw David as a driver that had a couple of great results with a team that more often than not is at the middle or toward the back of the field and just kind of wasn't really sure what they had with him. And I think if, had he been in the car the full season, I think this would have very much almost been like a, a year long tryout. He had a year, a one year contract with a one year team option at the end of it. And I think depending on what the free agent market was, um, what his other teammates did, how he performed, they could have very well signed him that he might've had a halfway decent year, and if they want to keep Alexander Rossi and they think that Christian Lungard is a better driver than him, they might have still moved on from David and signed Christian anyways, even if David had been in the car the whole year. Yeah, um, I, I still I feel like that is still so short sighted, you know, because yeah. I remember seeing Kyle, uh, Kyle Kirkwood and David Malukas going, you know, head to head in Indy Lights or Indy Next. And as good as we know Kyle Kirkwood is, um, David was right there the whole year, and it was a head-to-head -head battle. David put some amazing races together, so I really had a lot of belief in him. And two years maturing an Indy car in a Dale Cron racing car, um, yeah, I just I feel like it's very short-sighted to to not not wait and see what they have eventually. Yeah, I, I don't understand why they couldn't have just kept David retained, see, give him a couple of races, or give him whatever races he has at the end of the year to come back and, and earn this, earn the position. But I just, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to live and die on that hill. <laughs> I, I, I think I, part of me wonders too, if the team had been performing better outside of David Mm -hmm. um if this could have gone differently i mean we know now pato finished second on track he's credited with the win at saint pete but outside of that i mean alexander rossi has had a bit of a i mean tough is the wrong probably word but i don't i don't know exactly what the best adjective is he sits 10th in points he's um you know he finished kind of a so-so sixth at saint pete um, he moved up a couple spots. I, um, I think he finished. I think he was in the fast twelve, but didn't get in the fast six. So, so, so sixth. He was tenth at Long Beach, which which was a pretty heroic um, performance, given the fact that he uh, had a flat tire on lap one by virtue of his own teammate Pato Award running into the back of him and having to pit and getting off sequence. Um, has a pretty disastrous day when his. Uh, wheel comes off was not tightened properly during a pit stop finishes 25th at at Alabama at Barber and then finishes eighth it's kind of been like this like I don't feel like outside of this uh outside of Pato's podium at St. Pete like this team has been very up and down and looking for a flow and there could be some element of 
like there, we feel like this season is not going well. And one of the things that we have the ability to change right now is eliminating the chaos of trying to figure out when David's going to be healthy and being able to put someone in the car. Again, I'm not saying that that's the right thing to do. I do think, as you said, I think it's really easy for us to forget just how evenly matched Kyle and David were. Um, We gave Kyle a lot of grace when he had his rough uh, rookie season at AJ Foyt racing and he gets to a great team and he performs out of the box. And we think of as him as like maybe a fringe title contender this year or next um, with what he's been, been doing. So the other thing I'll add this and the final final comment on this topic, but the other thing I have a hard time with is that it completely devalues the indie ladder system. You know, we keep getting this like, oh, this F2, this shiny driver from Europe. Oh, let's let, you know, this big name, let's put him in the car. And it's like, well, oh, is F2 the feeder series to indie car or is indie next? And, you know, yeah. because the, the drivers that have come over to America, chosen the path of indie car, gone through the ladder, isn't that the guys that, you know, isn't that the path we want them to take? But I just have a, a really difficult time with knowing that how good I think David could could have been in that car. And the fact that he came up the ladder, he was great on the ovals, really had some some good, strong, strong results at uh, Gateway. And um, yeah, instead, we're, we're kind of abandoning that driver that came through the ladder and, and going for the shiny shiny name from f2 so yep, nope, you're right I, <laughs> I, I uh i hope he you know there's potentially going to be a handful of open seats out there um hope he is not someone like um like an oliver ask you for example that kind of had that one rough intro um season to indycar you know comes down with this concussion we know kind of the story he tried to fight through it and tell himself he wasn't dealing with what he was actually dealing with. And by that point he lost kind of, you know, kind of had a maybe a bit of a fracture within that organization. Wasn't going to be brought back. There wasn't a seat for him um, because he didn't come with any budget. Uh, And he was kind of out of his IndyCar career really quickly. Now David's family, luckily um, I think does have some budget. They certainly have some aspirations to, find a way to get into IndyCar in some way, shape or form. That's really tough right now, given um, what's going on behind the scenes with charters, with uh, the fact that there's no more full-time engine leases available anymore. Um, But I, I'm confident that with those things that David has at his disposal, along with the fact, again, as we've said, he's a very, he has a very uh, full resume coming up through um, the development ladder system. He's got two podiums in a coin car over these last couple of years at a time when coin has definitely been less than stellar. Um, so I, I'm certainly confident that we'll see him in a car again. I don't know if it'll happen this year because coin is the only team that has um, what I believe to be still open seats at the moment. And I don't know if that would be the best thing for him necessarily at this point. Um, but yeah. we'll see where this, this, um, merry-go-round of open seats takes him and we'll get into that more later i still think there's a lot of uncertainty on where the silly season is taking us um so maybe this, silly, yeah. let's let's Ed. let's hit on the santino <laughs> Rojan situation yeah. that just boiled over at the indie gp i mm-hmm. mean you know uh definitely have my thoughts on it but i definitely want to see what you think or uh, your perception of it being the paddock. Being so, there. so I think I have two separate um, branches of thought. I think I have one set of thoughts um, related to the to, related to what happened during the morning warm up. Essentially, um, if you weren't watching that, Santino. And Grosjean got into it. I think Santino kind of made a point to run Grosjean really wide, kind of threw it in, coming out of turn 10, going to turn 11. And Santino's point after the warm-up was essentially, hey, he did the same exact thing to me at Barber. And I just want to make a point that that wasn't okay. And uh, if you're going to drive me that way, then I'm going to do the same thing back to you. Um, I don't 
entirely remember the barber incident off the top of my head um, to know exactly how similar it was. But if all of that played out that way, I guess I'm not like entire, I don't entirely feel like there's a, a big thing about it. I will say, and I mentioned this off the pod and I've, I've talked to some other folks about it too, right or wrong in this situation, I appreciate Santino's willingness to be completely open and honest with us. Um, now that's probably understandable from a media standpoint. Like I want, I want people to be honest. I want people, I, you know, I don't mind some controversy that makes things more exciting and, um, and create some interesting storylines to cover. But from a journalist perspective, there are a lot of times, and I won't get into all the instances right now, but there are a lot of times lately where you feel like guys are just being really reserved. And some of time, sometimes it's probably because they feel like they have to, because they don't want to, and uh, you know, take off a sponsor or the team or create inter-team, uh, um, you know, argument. You want to burn bridges with yes. other teams yes. or team owners yeah. that, you know, you're may have, you know, may want to be working for in the future. So I, so, I from that so so from that standpoint like i appreciate santino's willingness to just be totally honest yeah. um where i have a problem is it seemed like that stuff should have been settled um once we get out of the warm-up santino got his time in um you know he got a chance to, to kind of punch back and i think we should have been even and i think it should have left there and now of course if you watch the race you know um it does not appear like that is how things were dealt with on lap one or lap two of the race whenever they finally um got into each other i think grosjean was the one that was coming back from maybe starting 23rd on the grid santino started 16th and um he grosjean finds his way up toward santino and by gosh, if Santino just doesn't completely run yeah. Rojan off the track, I think that was in turn 12, uh, just ran him unnecessarily wide. Like, yes, they're battling for position, but it was so obvious. Yeah. So un unnecessary. Yeah, unnecessarily wide is like the exact uh, terminology. I mean, we, or coming up in racing, we always had this saying of like, you know, you've got to earn the, you've got to win the corner. And if someone tries to go on the outside of you, you've got to enforce your position to, to maintain the position, but you've got to leave them survival room, mm -hmm. which in the following corner is exactly what happened to Santino. I think it was Marcus passed him on the inside mm -hmm. and ran him wide, but he didn't run him all the way to the grass. He gave yeah. him space to concede, but you know, not and but stay on the track. And it, that's exactly mm -hmm. how. Santino should have played that in the preceding corner. Um, and as you saw, it just, I think, saw that it was Grosjean, um, you know, went for the likes on social media and just ran him off the track. I mean, in the process, I think it damaged his car. It's un it did. It, yeah. And, and it appears that way. He, he did, like it, it ruined his own race. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I think he finished, he, they retired the car. He, he ran a good ways longer, but I think they retired the car with 30 laps left in the race with some mechanical damage that I don't entirely know what it was, but I know I remember hearing on the radio like immediately after that, Santino kind of complaining that something on his car might not be quite right. And I, I don't feel like he totally recovered from that. I, I think he was kind of around that like 18th to 20th range for a while. And so maybe, um, uh, so maybe the, the, the damage didn't maybe ruin his race immediately, but I do know. So uh, he was, I think they were fighting over 17th. So Sa Santino was 17th. Grosjean was 18th at the time. So Santino does that to hold on to 17th. And by the time he gets to turn 14 to complete the lap, he lost two spots. He was yeah. 19th. So yeah. had he, has, had he fought fair with Grosjean at worst case scenario, you fall back to 18th. And so he's already one spot worse than that. Yeah. Um, he still has another 15 races to race with remain. So I'm sure yeah. that'll be uh, remembered um, and passed back. But yeah, I mean, it, you know, there's my only, I, I mean, I know Santino, we talk and I know what he's like and he's, so like I my only issue is that I don't feel like sometimes how he is on the broadcast and how he like puffs his chest out tries to 
play this character that's a badass and i don't feel like that's him so i have a hard time with it and i'm like dude just focus on what you your, your job as a driver and go out there and drive everyone the same don't i feel like he's trying to create some drama trying to build this persona you know um get some social media um involved you know engagement um and it's like I, you know just be yourself man like just let your driving do the talking you don't have to become this persona of this badass and that that's that's the only issue i feel like every badass driver we can remember in the history of most sports they just exist they just are a badass mm -hmm. you know they don't have to try to be a badass and yep. i i just hope that that doesn't um you know come back to bite him in the butt in the butt you know uh and you know the rest of the season and in in his future career you know i think that he's just got to be authentic yep i agree all right um let's transition into uh looking at indy 500 practice week and qualifying weekend here real quick before we finish up um as i mentioned uh actually since we've been recording ims confirmed um that the day has been a complete washout uh not a complete washout their cars aren't going on track anymore the rest of the day so the whatever it was 23 minutes and 47 seconds of on track action where the the um where we had green flag running today is all we'll see today on tuesday opening day of practice they've added two hours onto tomorrow's schedule so cars will start running at 10 a.m they will be allowed to be on track weather permitting um again I don't know that we're going to get eight hours of dry open on track running tomorrow, but we will see how things play out. But um, instead of starting at noon, we'll start at 10 a.m. They'll run all the way to 6 p.m. according to the schedule. Um, just a quick run through of how this week and this weekend works. If you're unfamiliar, um, Thursday cars will be on track for a, a normal practice noon until 6 p.m. Friday, same time. But this is when cars get that additional boost for qualifying, um, allowing them to run, you know, the type of the setups, the lap times, the lap speeds that we will get used to seeing during their four lap qualifying runs on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday morning, we have one hour of practice. I believe the field split in half and it's 30 minutes each. Or per group, you typically don't see everyone out there for that practice. It's a handful of guys that want to see how their car is handling. Um, maybe they fixed something or tinkered with something overnight, and they just want to see um, if the fix worked, if, if the car is running fine. And then we get going with those um, qualifying runs at 11 a.m. on Saturday morning. They run through the entire field once there's a random draw on Friday evening to set that initial one through 34 order. And then once everyone gets to uh, gets their opportunity to go in line first, it's whoever hops in line. There's two lanes, um, one lane. You don't have to give up your qualifying um, performance from before, but it's not the priority lane. The priority lane, if we get is important when we get to the end, folks um, are using that if they're willing to drop their time, meaning you take the track and you now are not qualified in the race as long as we've had 33 cars complete uh, a four lap run and you are trying to work your way back into the field. You typically do that if you are right around that bubble or maybe you fell out and so you have nothing to drop to begin with. Um, that runs until 5.50 when you'll hear the gun go off. And then we have uh, the top 12, the fast 12, that starts at 3.05 on Sunday afternoon. Um, it's an hour of running everyone and that top 12 gets one run, one four lap run to see where they stack up. They'll cut it down to six. Um, they'll transition to the last chance qualifier group, which are those who did not qualify within the top 30 on Saturday. Um, they will be four cars fighting for the final three spots on the grid. That last row, one car will be sent home. And after that, we have the run for pole. Again, the top six cars that qualified in the fast 12 will go six down to one. And we will see who will lead the field to green for the 108th running of the Indianapolis 500. Um, again, uh, Stefan, back to your experience doing this race. 
a handful of times when we're thinking about qualifying. Um, I know Fast Friday is really important. I know that can also be a day that is really condition and weather dependent. Um, yeah. What are we, when you're a driver, um, maybe even in practice over these next couple of days, cars don't necessarily have the boost in it yet. I know you talked about, say, Alex Polo, for example, you saw him and just could tell by the, the way in which his car was running on track um, that he was going to be someone that was going to be someone you would have to contend with to try to, to fight for this win and probably even fight for the pole. What are you looking at, at or seeing as a driver when you see th that someone has a really good car? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, it's really easy to just look at the time and scoring screen and go, oh, okay, like this guy's really competitive. He's just run a 228 or 229. Um, you know, that is a little bit misleading sometimes. I mean, at the end of the day, you still have to have a fast car to be able to do a 228 or 229. You know, that means that, uh, you know, you've A, got the speed in the car and B, you've got the handling. So even in the big, big old toe that you're getting, uh, you're still able to stay in it and stay flat all the way around and put up that kind of lap. So um, it's it can be misleading at times to just look at the time of scoring, but mm -hmm. there is there is uh, some credibility to to those those speeds we see even on practice day like today, where all those times at the top were were just toe laps. Um, what I'm seeing when I'm on the track is how close uh, these cars could you know a, a car can run to a pack of cars, you know, not just how close they can run behind a single car or two cars, but it's when you get three or four cars deep, the turbulence, the dirty air just becomes uh, really overwhelming. And the impact that it has on reducing the downforce level of the following cars, um, you know, it becomes that you make, makes you have to lift more. So what I'm seeing, what I'm looking for is seeing how close a car can get to a pack of cars of four or five and make uh make passes happen that far back in a pack because usually when you get to about four or five cars deep um it gets pretty stagnant you're kind of just riding there because you get this invisible wall you can't make any ground up and you're just trying not to get too close where you have to have a big lift and then you drop back a position so you kind of just get riding in this this kind of train that's connected by dirty air in between um so if a car can get up into that kind of a group and actually, you know, get close enough to make a pass or even just run just even just closer than, than you can, you know that they've got a very good mechanical balance underneath them uh, where even though they've, they're losing the downforce from the dirty air, they're still able to stay closer than, than you are. So that's very telling, you know, it's, it's hard to know right now in those next couple of days, Who's, it's easy to see a good car, um, but it's not so necessarily easy to see who hasn't got the speed to make it into, you know, make it in qualifying and, and who, who hasn't got the speed that's going to be going home. You know, that's, it's a little tricky to see. And even on the no toe speeds, you know, no one in the next two days, I assume, will be really focusing on qualifying. You know, on Friday, then you start to see a couple of trends appear. Okay, like this, this, this group, you know, like last year, we know, okay, this group really not got it going on. Um, they're they're going to be contenders for the the uh, last row shootout. And, and it, that came true. So we'll, we'll start to see that. Um, I think it's probably a little bit more predictable than, well, a little bit less predictable in certain ways than last year. Uh, we kind of all knew that there was four cars from Real that just didn't have speed. Uh, this year, I think we're going to see a resurgence from Rahal. I don't expect to see them down in that last row shootout. I could be wrong, but I just feel like Bobby's not going to let that happen two years in a row. Mm -hmm. you know, that was the ultimate uh, sort of catalyst to be like, okay, we're not letting this happen again. So I expect to see them have a resurgence. Um, it's hard to go against Palou to, to compete for the pole, you know, I also could see Lawson competing for the pole. He's got a great car underneath him. He's a good driver. He's a professional world-class driver. At the end of the day, he's going to figure this all out. Um, and, you know, Chevy's going to be very incentivized. Uh, so I feel like 
that whole combination really could see uh, Lawson competing at least for the front row. I expect to see him on the front row at least. Um, and you know, if um if you had to uh, make a bet today on which cars are maybe going to be uh, in the last row shootout, I wouldn't be surprised to see Dale Coin cars, Young Coast maybe, and maybe DRR. And that's no slight to any of them because every thirty four cars that are entered going to be trying to shoot for the 33 spots all of them are so strong nowadays like there's no like weak links you know every single entry they're spending million dollar plus to to put that car on track all month you know there's no bringing it on a trailer spending bare minimum only buying a set of tires for qualifying it's like none of that exists anymore so there's no like uh weak links all 34 are strong contenders you know, there's, it's, it's really going to be, there's going to be some tears on Saturday. That is for sure. Oh, sorry. On Sunday. Um, that is for sure. Because there's a lot of money that, uh, that was just lost uh, by one group uh, that gets, you know, that is the 34th uh, qualifier and goes home. So, um, you know, and those four cars or those three teams I highlighted there, it's simply because the rest of the organizations, they've really started to, um, kind of grouped together in a way you've got engineers that have gone from this team over to you know let's say engineer from ganassi and mike michael cannon has gone over to Foyt, made them strong now penske has that because they've partnered you know craig capson has gone from Gana uh, from uh, mclaren over to andretti so whatever setups that and you know mclaren had last year andretti have now and they're strong so there's just a lot of engineers and information transferred among the paddock where there's really arguably 29 cars that have the secret source and the knowledge to you know find the extra little few tenths of mile an hour and then there's the cars that don't and that list of cars that don't used to be so much bigger it used to be <laughs> a group of 10 12 15 cars so the back of the pack was was you know you you could a little you know a a good qualifying run or a find a, a tweak that works in the practice days could, could it really elevate your position and now it's like those 29 cars they're working on their cars from june last year up to now and it's really hard to make those kind of gains to to really you know get yourself out of the bottom so it's just a very close field i really expect it to be competitive all the way through and like I said, there's going to be some tears on Sunday night, that's for sure. Yeah, I think you can even talk your way through it going from the opposite end. I mean, let's start with Ganassi. Um, do we think even with three guys running the 500 for the first time, do we think any of those three cars are going to be somewhere around the bubble? No, I don't nope. think so. Um, <laughs> I, I, again, like I, like I talked about with, with Kiffin, and we've actually seen it um, on track with Marcus Armstrong with Leland Slungle so far. Like Those guys have plenty of speed. They're going to have great cars. Um, so let's go. Let's. So Andretti, do we think they're going to be on the bubble? No, I do not think so. Do we think Penske's going to be on the bubble? No, I don't think so. Do we think um, Foyt is going to be on the bubble? No. Do we, yeah. Do we? Yeah. Do we think Foyt is not? Certainly not with what they showed last year. I mean, even Benjamin Peterson was in the the Fast Twelve last year. Um, do I think that Stingray Rob is going to be in the Fast Twelve? I don't. I don't know. But I don't think he's going to be on the bubble. Let's no. put it that way. Um, do I think Aaron McLaren is going to be on the bubble? No. Do I think, um, again, uh, Ed Carpenter Racing has a rookie in Christian Rasmussen. They have consistently had their young drivers up toward the front, no matter how much experience they have and no matter how well they've performed at other races. So do I think Christian is going to be on the front row? No. But do I think he's going to be on the bubble? Also not. Um, so that so that's um, five teams. Um, RLL, again, I don't know if they're going to be in contention to win this race. I, like you, also don't think that they are going to be at the back of the grid. So that gives you six teams that we feel like are all pretty solidly in there. Um, it's kind of the wild card is, is Real to see, okay, yes, if they've made they've made improvements, but how much improvements? I mean, yeah. that's kind of the unknown. I think they're going to be fun, like safe, you know, just based on conversations I've had. Mm -hmm. uh, but... We'll, we'll find out. Yeah, and that's actually seven teams. We go to 
maybe where you start to ask some questions. Meyer Shank Racing, I think Elio's yeah. fine. Um, I think and they've got the already set up. They're, they're, they're gold. Yeah, the, yeah. Like the, the one person I guess I would ask about, and this is maybe where you start to ask some questions, mm -hmm. Tom Blomquist. We haven't seen a whole lot out of him this year. He has he showed so much speed in IMSA, and I know that this is a different discipline. This is a different car. This is a different series. These are tracks, most of which he hasn't run on before. Um, so, no, I, I don't know that I'm predicting that Tom Blomquist is going to be in the bottom four, but he, that's maybe a guy where you start to, like, wonder more so we just haven't seen anything out of him yet that would, yeah. like, thoroughly convince you otherwise. And so that's maybe my first maybe small question mark. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, go... yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I get what you're saying. It's hard to know what he's gonna feel when he gets onto the like onto the speedway for the first time. It's mm -hmm. like going through that qualifying procedure for the first time. But I just, I, you know, I, the Myershank performance is always so closely tied to how strong Andretti is, and I really sure. feel that the improvements they've made since last year. I don't think they were particularly happy with how their month went last year. You know, it just, it wasn't up to the standards that they expect. And I could tell, like, they were ready to make some adjustments and make some improvements. And I feel like they've made those. Um, so I, I expect that whole group, you know, now you're talking seven cars, that all of a sudden has risen. You know, it, it, that's what's so difficult these days is like, you talk about organizations that are five cars deep or seven yeah. cars deep, you know, all it takes is for that organization to find you know, half a mile an hour and all of a sudden you've been passed by seven cars and it's like, yep. damn, <laughs> you know? So I don't know. I, I, I definitely wouldn't be my first choice to be close to the bubble. I don't think. Yep. But. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so we go to, um, who do we have left here? We have Hunkos. Um, yeah, Hunkos and Coin in terms of full-time teams. So um, I think Grosjean has shown an ability to, I mean, I think back to his first year in the 500 with uh, 2022, the rest of Andretti was like out to lunch and he was still able to put it in the fast 12. He is not as much yeah. so in races as we've seen, but he's shown an ability to find speed inside a car, no matter if it's coin car, it's an Andretti car, even if it's a Hunkos car that, a lot of other drivers can't produce. And so I don't feel like he's at risk to be in this Canapino. Um, again, one of those drivers that you like, he showed fairly well last year as a rookie. Um, but when you start thinking about the improvements that other teams are making on this grid and you know yeah. that JHR maybe isn't just quite as deep, that's another team that you're like, I don't think they're, I don't think they're bad. They haven't given me a reason to think that they're going to be down there, but that's where you again start asking questions. Um, a team that yeah. I feel maybe a little bit more confident about is Dale Coin Racing in that they just have so many moving pieces from a driver perspective this whole season, swapping guys in and out. Nolan, um, I mean, this is his, he, what he ran at Thermal and ran at Long Beach. This is his third time in an Indy car ever from a race weekend standpoint. I know he's got a lot of time to build up. I know he's a great, fast, young driver. Um, but I start to worry a little bit if, uh, you know, we saw uh, a coin car in this bottom four a year ago yeah. with Stingray Rob. Um, so that's maybe your kind of your your first sign. Um, Catherine Legg, um, she, uh, you know, f for what it's worth, all four of those RLL cars were slow last year and she was the fastest among those four. So um, also, a, also someone who is a, a one-off who hasn't been in an Indy car since last year. So that's maybe a, another wild card. If I had to pick between which one of those two that I thought had a better chance to be in that bottom, I'd probably say Nolan, but those are two drivers that I would watch out for. And weirdly enough, um, try and Reinbolt racing. Um, not a team that we're used to seeing down here toward the bottom very often, if at all. Um, a team that has had great race performance the last couple years. But the one thing I worry about is how much has changed in this car over the last year that they've had to buy parts for, get them fitted properly, wait, sit on their hands, get you know, get more parts. They haven't been on track to work out some of the bugs that some of these other teams have in their cars. 
they only ran, I think, like a combined 30 laps at the open test. That was something that that delay, I think, hurt as much as anyone. Connor maybe got a chance to run 25 laps, and Ryan Hunter Ray had some sort of a mechanical issue and ran like seven laps that were not at speed really at all. And so now we find, you know, they missed a bulk of two days there. You missed um, with both cars most of a day here. And now you're, you've only got a couple days and that's a team that you start to maybe just, you, you worry about getting all of the gremlins sorted for a team like that. Connor has speed. Ryan has speed. Those guys have been around this place so often. So I, um, I certainly wouldn't be surprised to see them up yeah. in that like mid pack area, but I think more from a, circumstance standpoint you worry about them um, uh, as a team I mean, what's yeah 100 percent. i mean like they were well i was 25th qualified 25th last year um i was 0.4 mile an hour behind hunter ray he qualified in the morning first car to qualify actually so a little mm -hmm. more favorable conditions um and he qualified 19th and that was the difference there just 0.4 mile an hour was the difference between 19th and 25th um and then, so what gets interesting is those cars between us, there was a lot of Andretti cars between them. If it, it's, it's not so much about how good Dry and Reinbold is, it's about mm -hmm. how everyone else has made improvements from yeah. last year to this year. If they've stood still, then they're, they go from 19th and 25th to 30th and 31st very quickly, you know? So if they haven't been able to keep the rate of uh, advancement, the rate of, uh, improvements, uh, performance improvements up, then they quickly will find themselves in trouble because you take seven Andretti cars that were uh, around where I was and between me and Hunter Ray, you put them, if they found a mile an hour over the, over the summer of last year and over the winter leading into this year, then boom, they're, they've leapfrogged them. Um, if uh, you know, you're adding a fifth Ganassi car automatically goes, you know, uh, above us and uh, above DRR where they would be. So it's not so much their strength. It's just the strength of everyone else around them that has improved. So, um, yeah, they could, they could really find themselves in trouble. Um, you know, if they haven't been able to keep up the rate of improvements. Yeah. Um, there's always a surprise. It seems like there's always a surprise yeah. in that bottom group. So there's going to inevitably someone be someone that we didn't mention that we feel like is comfortably safe that is not going to be. And we'll be excited to see who that is. I know this has been a bit of a long one, so we'll leave it there. Um, again, follow along at IndyStar.com. We will have um, you know, this podcast, I'm shooting uh, videos every day on our Pit Pass Live series that will be posted on the website, on YouTube, on Facebook, um, kind of breaking down what's going on on track every single day. At MS, I have loads and loads of written stories, um, both what's going on around here, some features, some enterprise stuff that we've been working on, me and others, for a long time. Really excited to share all of that with you guys. Um, excited to hopefully maybe be back uh next week to have a maybe more of a 500 race centric preview pod see how qualifying shakes out and we uh, will be there before we know i know we always look forward to um 11 and a half months out of the year of getting to this point and then once it gets rolling it gets rolling really fast so i'm um, excited to be covering this on the ground yet again um, i know we wish stefan was here with us in a car um but appreciate his insight from home um hope you enjoy watching as much as you can qualifying and practice action going on excited to hear what you think about what we see on track here these next couple of days all right so yeah before we go let's uh let's make some bold predictions who are you saying for paul nathan okay um i'm gonna take willpower um uh, i think i think alex uh i think alex has um I don't know. I, I guess what I'm trying to get at, I don't know that Polo has done much to get knocked off, but I'm going to go a little bold. Will has been, he's been talking really confident in press conferences yeah. that we've had, like been very outspoken about how much improvement he feels like this, feels like this team and Chevy has made from a qualifying standpoint. We've had, I was, I was going through it. We've had um, dating back to 2020, we've had, four consecutive Honda cars on pole, Marco Andretti, Scott Dixon twice, and then Alex Pillow. Um, 
Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe I, I look silly here in a couple of days, but Will has convinced me both with his performance um, in some other different kinds of tracks this year and some of what we've seen out of Chevy. Um, the fact that Will hasn't gotten a pole at uh, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway on the oval in his career. I feel like he's due in a way. He's been really close uh, on pole each of these last couple races. Again, I know what you do at Barber and IMS Road Course is not maybe necessarily conducive to what you do at IMS, but I feel like he's just in a really good groove right now. Um, and I'll, yeah. I'll take a flyer on the uh, king of IndyCar poles to, to get a historic one this weekend on Sunday. All right, I'm going to go with Dixon, okay? I know it's not a very exciting <laughs> choice, but, yeah, I mean, I, I feel like Ganassi's still got the, the speed, so it'll be, I think, a Ganassi shootout between Dixon and Palou. But I like your choice. I like the, the willpower angle. I, I that's, that's a bold strategy, but I think it's a, it makes a lot of sense to me. And then what about uh, who's who's going to be going home? Are you feeling um, confident enough to say? I'm going to say, um, hmm. Well, this is tough, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Cause you feel bad. Cause like, I know. Not, I know. Like, I'm not rooting against anyone. Um, maybe we I, don't, I don't want to put that bad juju out in the world. No, you know? uh, I don't, I'll, I'll say, I don't want to pick which one. I think it's going to be one of the coin cars. I'm I was going to say the same way. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, and, and odds are, it's probably not going to be, it's probably going to be someone that we're not either totally expecting or one of yeah. those other cars that are kind of on the fringe and maybe coin finds a way to, to survive. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see, we'll see how accurate those predictions are. And then we'll get to some, make some, hopefully make some more fun ones next week about yes. who's going to yeah. win this race. It's probably going to be even more tough because there's so many good <laughs> cars, so many good drivers in this field. Um, thanks again for those watching, please um, rate, review, subscribe, all those fun things. We appreciate your support. Um, and we'll look forward to breaking down everything that we see over the next couple of days on track at IMS in next week's episode of IndyCar Weekly.